Hi folks, so <clears throat> today we would uh, Google up Erlang. How do we spell it? Erlang or Erlang. <clears throat> it's a very popular, excuse me, it's a very popular uh, functional programming language for, uh, especially for the embedded systems, real-time constraints, uh, systems which have real-time constraints as well as uh, unsurprisingly in the telecommunications area since this was uh, to begin with uh, made by Ericsson. All right, so let's see. Let's get started. I googled up Erlang and this is its homepage on the web erlang.org. So what is Erlang? Erlang is a programming language used to build massively scalable soft real-time systems with requirements on high availability, right? So high when high availability is uh, an important consideration, so this language comes in handy. Soft real-time systems are those which almost, which usually, you know, comply with the real-time constraints of responsiveness of uh, the time for a service to complete, etc. But uh, do not uh, guarantee an always uh, and uh, every time um, compliance. Such a compliance is common with hard real-time systems. All right, so some of its uses are in telecoms, unsurprisingly, since Ericsson uh, invented this. <clears throat> Banking, e-commerce, computer telephony, and instant messaging. Erlang's runtime system has built-in support for concurrency, distribution, and fault tolerance. So this is very important that uh, it, it has built-in support for concurrency, distribution, and fault tolerance. What does that mean? That means that when writing an Erlang program, I do not really need to put a lot of effort to make my software utilize the concurrent um, paradigm, so to say, like for example, threat safety, so on and so forth. And of course, the issues of distribution that are needed for scaling, fault tolerance being robust in the face of uh, faults, right? All right, so OTP, what is OTP? Yeah, it clearly does not mean one-time password. So OTP is a set of Erlang libraries and design principles providing middleware to develop these systems. It includes its own distributed database, applications to interface towards other languages. So uh, let's see, debugging and release handling tools. All right, so this is the uh, for the lack of a better word, something like a runtime with a, with a distributed database for Erlang. Okay, let's see what's, what else is there on the <clears throat> website. There are some recommended books. All right, so what else? There is a download section, a documentation section, about section. So let's just quickly see the about section. So core development, Erlang is a programming language originally developed at the Ericsson Computer Science Laboratory. Open Telecom Platform is a collection of middleware and libraries in Erlang. Erlang OTP has been battle tested in a number of Ericsson products for building robust fault tolerant distributed applications. For example, this ATM switch, main developer and maintainer is the Erlang OTP unit at Ericsson. All right. So it is uh, released under Apache license two. All right. So let's see the documentation. So there is that a detailed documentation. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So let's let's go back. Let's let's go back. All right, so let's see what does it say? How do we get started? So getting started with Erlang uses guide. It is, uh, uh, and let's go to the introduction, top of the chapter. This section is a quick start tutorial to get you started with Erlang. Everything in this section is true, but only part of the truth. <laughs> For example, only the simplest form of the syntax is shown, not all the assorted forms. Also parts that are greatly simplified are indicated with manual. This means that a lot more information on the subject is to be found in the Erlang book or in 
the reference manual. Yeah, that's fine. We, you know, we understand. The reader of this section is assumed to be familiar with the following computers, basics, blah, blah, computer topics, references, blah, 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 blah. We'll see that later. So let's just go move forward. Computer topics is here, sequential program. All right, so sequential programming. Let's, let's go here to the users guide. Okay, it's the same thing. All right, sequential programming, top of the chapter, the Erlang shell. Most operating systems have a command line, inter command interpreter or shell. Unix and Linux have many. Windows has a command prompt. Erlang has its own shell where bits of Erlang code can be written directly and evaluated to see what happens. All right. Start the Erlang shell in Linux or Unix by starting a shell or command interpreter and typing ERL. So you will see something like this. So this is there the, the shell. Type 2 plus 5 in the shell and then press enter. Notice that you tell the shell you are done entering code by finishing with a full stop. Okay. So just like a semicolon is, is there in C. Uh, just a moment. So just like semicolon uh, tells of the line, the, the code line delimit in uh, C source code. So dot it seems is uh, is uh, does the same for Erlang shell. All right. So as shown, the Erlang shell numbers the lines that that can be entered as one to, to then that it correctly says that two plus five is seven. Okay. If you make writing mistakes in the shell, you can delete with the backspace key. There are many more editing commands in the shell. Okay, we'll see that later. Notice many, many line numbers given by the shell in the following example are out of sequence. This is because this tutorial was written and code tested in separate session. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Here is a bit more complex calculation. So this is a, uh, an arithmetic expression and it gives the answer. Notice the use of brackets, the multiplication operator. Division operator as in normal arithmetic. Press Control C to shut down the Erlang system and the Erlang shell. All right. Type A to leave the Erlang system. Blah blah blah. All right. Modules and functions. A programming language is not much use if you can only run it run code from the shell. So here is a small Erlang program. Enter it into a file named tut.erl using a pseudo text editor. The file named tut.erl is important, and also that it is in the same directory as the one where you started erl. If you're lucky, your editor has an Erlang mode that makes it easy for you to edit and format your code nicely. So we'll see that later. But you can manage perfectly well without. Here is a code to enter. Module tut, export double dash one, double. Okay, what is happening? It is not hard to guess that this program doubles the value of numbers. Okay, the first two lines of the code are described later. Let us compile the program. This can be done in an Erlang shell as follows. So C dot, okay, the okay dot means that the compilation is okay. It says error. If it says error, it means that there is some mistake, blah, blah, additional error message given. I yeah, yeah, typically. So now we run the program inside the shell, okay. As expected, double of 10 is 20. Now let us get back into the first two lines of the code. Erlang programs are written in files. Each file contains an Erlang module. So this is important. Each file contains an Erlang module. That is seemingly um, the tradition. I don't know how, how much is the is it enforced. Seems looks like it is enforced. The first line of the code in the module is the module name. All right. So this is a module name. Dot. Okay. So the module is called dot. Notice the full stop at the end of the line. The files which are used to store the module must have the same name as the module, but with extension dot erl. In this case, the file name is dot.erl. When you're using a function in another module, the syntax module name, module name, colon, function name arguments is used, all right, for scope resolution. So the following means call function double in the module dot with argument 10. Dot, 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 dot. Okay, good. The second line says that the module dot contains a function called double, which takes one argument x in our example. So it is exporting a module, it is exporting a function called double, which takes one argument. The second line also says that this function can be called from outside the module tut because it is exporting it, right? Also notice dot, all right. Now for a more complicated example, the factorial of a number. For example, the factorial of four is this, 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 this is the following code. So what is it doing? Factorial of one is one, factorial of n is n and two, factorial of n minus one, all right? So this is a recursive definition. 
with the base condition is indicated by this, all right? So this is a module called tooth one that contains a function called fact, which takes one argument in. The first part says that the factorial of one is one. Notice that this part ends with a semicolon, yes. This indicates that there is more of the function to come, all right, so this is important. The second part says that the factorial of n is n multiplied by the factorial of n minus one, yeah. Notice that this part ends with a dot saying that there are no more parts of this function. So we compile the file as we did earlier and it's okay. So calculate the factorial of four, total fact four, this, this. Here the function fact in module to one is called with argument four. A function can have many arguments. Let us expand the module total with a function to multiply two numbers. All right. So yeah, this, this is a new function that is added. All right. So notice that it, will also, it is also required to expand the export line with the information that there is another function with two arguments, yeah. So apparently if we do not uh, update the export directive, that means this, uh, more, uh, this file will not export those functions, right? So that's pretty typical. Uh, you know, it, it, it has parallels in pretty much all languages. All right, so we use the multiply function and it does what is expected of it. In this example, the numbers are integers and the arguments in the functions in the board blah, 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 are variables. Variables must start with a capital letter. And okay, they must start, okay? Apparently, it would enforce it then, right? If it is saying it, they must start. Okay, so next we come to the concept of atoms. Atom is another data type in Erlang. Atoms start with a small letter as opposed to uh, variables. For example, Charles centimeter inch, atoms are simply names, nothing else. They are not like variables which can have a value, all right? Enter the next program in a file named tut2.erl. It can be useful for converting from inches to centimeters and conversely. So we have the module tut2. We export the convert function which takes two arguments. So we write the convert function. So this is an overloaded function, right? Uh, okay, what is the data type of the second variable? I think it will guess automatically, okay? So we convert to, to take two parameters, we apply a conversion factor, divide by it, and if we are given a centimeter, we have a conversion factor, we multiply by it. So we compile it to convert three to inch, so this, and convert seven to centimeters, this. So notice the introduction of decimals, floating point numbers without any explanation. Hopefully you can cope with that. Let us see what happens if someone, if something other than centimeter or inch is entered in the convert function in the second parameter. So let's say miles, an exception is thrown, no function clause matching this, all right. The two parts of the conversion, convert function are called its clauses, okay. So, while in other languages we call this uh, function uh, overloading, but over here they call it, in the jargon of uh, Erlang, they call it class clauses. As shown, miles is not part of either of the clauses. The Erlang system cannot match either of the clauses, so an error message function clause is returned. The shell formats the error, error message nicely, but the error tuple is saved in the shell's history list and can be output by the shell command v slash one. Okay. Uh, v slash one. So over here it is saying V12. Ah, so okay, so it is saying, uh, yeah, it is saying show the last 12, apparently it is saying show the last 12 errors. From, okay, all right, so next we go to tuples. Now the TUT2 program is hardly good programming style. Consider total convert three inch. Does this mean that three is in inches or does it mean that three is in centimeters? Exactly, it's not well, uh, it's not good programming style. It's not unambiguous. Erlang has a way to group things together to make things more understandable. These are called tuples and are surrounded by curly braces, okay? So inch comma three denotes three inches and centimeter comma five denotes five centimeters. Okay, as you remember, this is an atom inch. It has no value, right? Likewise for centimeter. Okay. Now let us write a new program that converts centimeters to inches and conversely enter the following code in a file called to 
good. 3 dot URL. All right. So what is it doing? It is uh, there is a convert length function and it's parameter of both functions. Uh, the both clauses of the function is a tuple now instead of two separate parameters. All right. So what is it doing over here? It is uh, it is uh, returning a tuple as well, which is inch and then part of the original tuple, which was X, it is dividing that with the conversion factor. Similar thing is happening over here, right? <coughs> so we compile and test. All right, test convert length inch. We give it five inches. It is returning us uh, 12.7 centimeters. Okay, that's good. It makes things uh, clear as opposed to being ambiguous. Notice on line 16 that 5 inches is converted to centimeters and back again and reassuringly get back to the original value. Yeah. That is the argument to a function can be the result of another function. Yep. Yep. Uh, They're basically nested, right? Nested function calls, yeah. The, the argument given to the function is first, oh, okay, so let's see. Consider how the line 16 above works. The argument given to the function inch comma five is first matched against the first head clause of convert length, which is this. That is convert length centimeter x. It can be seen that centimeter x does not match inch five. The head is the bit before the, uh, this side. So basically head is, if we go back a bit, so head is this part of the function clause, right? This is the, after this side is the implementation and uh, this is, these are two heads of the two clauses of the function, right? All right. So let's go back again. Can be seen that centimeter comma x is da, da, da. okay. This having failed, <coughs> excuse me. This having failed, let us try the head of the next clause that is convert length inch y. This matches and y gets a value of five. Tuples can have more than two parts. In fact, as many parts as you want and contain any valid, any valid Erlang term. All right. So, for example, to represent the temperature of various areas of the world. There are, there's an acid tuple, Moscow is a, and then there is another tuple, centigrade minus 10. All right. Tuples have a fixed number of items in them. Each item in a tuple is called an element. All right. So in this tuple, this has two elements. First element is Moscow and the second element is another tuple. In, a, in the second element of the tuple, uh, uh, in the second element, which is itself a tuple, there are two individual uh, terms, which are elements C and minus 10. All right. All right. So now we next come to lists. Whereas tuples group things together, it is also needed to represent lists of things. Lists in Erlang are surrounded by square brackets. For example, a list of the temperatures of various cities in the world can be. So we have a list with square brackets and then, you know, each item of the list is a tuple. All right. Good. Notice that the list was so long that it did not fit on one line. This does not matter. Erlang allows line breaks at all, at all sensible places, but not, for example, in the middle of atoms. Yeah, the atoms and teachers and others, of course. A useful way of looking at parts of lists is by using the pipe sign. This is best explained by an example using the shell. All right, so first or the rest is equal to one, two, three, four, five. First one, the rest. To separate the first element from the rest of the list, this is used, all right. Okay, another example is E1, E2, and the rest in R. So that would mean one would come in E1, two would come in E2, and R would be a another list of three, four, five, six, seven. And that is exactly what it is. All right. Okay. Here you see the use of pipe to get the first two elements from the list. If you 
uh, try to get more elements from the list and there are elements in the list and error is returned. Notice also the special case of the list with no elements, that is the empty list, all right? So this is clearly wrong because it exp Ah, interesting, wait. So a comma b colon c is equal to one dot comma two. So it is returning one comma two. But why is it so? Uh, a is one, b is two, c is the empty list. Ah, okay, because an empty list is always uh, part of the list, I guess. It is forcing C to bind with the empty list, okay? In the previous examples, new variable names are used instead of reusing the old ones. First, there is blah, blah, blah. The reason for this is that a variable can only be given a value once in its context, all right? More about this later. Following example shows how to find the length of a list. Enter the following code in a file named .4.trl. All right, so list of length. It expects a length, a, a list, but the interesting thing is that over here, uh, it, it's not um, giving a name to the list, right? Okay, so this returns zero. This is a base clause of the recursive function, I guess. And then you have another clause of the function which uh, separates the list and first and rest part. And what does it do is that it gives one plus list of length of the rest. Wow, that's clean. And it recursively does a beautiful job, right? Okay, so C, tit4, okay, tit4, tit4, list length, blah, 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 is seven. Okay, so this is a, a recursive definition. And this is very typical in functional languages, right? For example, in Lisp, um, things happen recursively often too. All right, so explanation, the length of an empty list is obviously zero, blah, blah. The length of a list with first element and remaining is this, advanced readers only. This is not tail recursive. There is a better way to write this function, okay? In general, tuples are used where records or structs are used in other languages, okay? Also, lists are used when representing things with varying sizes. That is where linked lists are used in other languages, all right? So tuples in general are used where records or structures or classes, I guess, are used in other languages. Um, not really classes, structs, I guess, because code is not assigned. And lists are used where linked lists are used in other languages. Erlang does not have a string data type. Instead, strings can be represented by lists of Unicode characters, right? That's what they are. So, but they have chosen not to make it a uh, first class um, uh, data type. Okay. This implies, for example, that the list 97, 98, 99 is equivalent to ABC. Interesting, because of the ASCII code or, or the Unicode. The Erlang shell is <laughs> clever and guesses what list you mean and outputs it in what it thinks is the most appropriate form. For example, 30, 97, 98, it returns the equivalent uh, character associated with these codes. Okay. Next, we move on to maps. Maps are a set of key to value association. Yeah, that's what it is. Key value pair is a map. These associations are encapsulated with the hash and curly braces. To create an association from key to the value 42, we use hash, curly brace on, key, and you this sign and 42, all right. Okay. Let us jump straight into the deep end with an example using some interesting features. Yep, that's good. The following example shows how to calculate alpha blending using maps to reference color and alpha channels, whatever that means. Okay, enter the code in a file named color.trl. Let's see. So this is a file, so which has, a, it is the file named color. So module name is color, export a fun two functions. One is new. It gets, uh, it accepts four arguments. One is blend, it accepts two arguments. And we define is channel V, is float V, and also this, and also whatever this means, I don't know. All right, there is a new RGBA when blah, 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 blah. Okay. So blend is an overloaded function or a function which has clauses, three clauses. 
one with two parameters, one with uh, three parameters, and one with the, uh, this is probably with the, uh, I don't know what does this mean, underscore, let's see. Likewise, alpha is a function which expects a map and does something. Red is a function which also expects a map and does something. Likewise for green and blue. All right, so let's see what happens. We compile it, it gets compiled. C1 is equal to color new, this, this, this. Okay, it, it tells how is it evaluating uh, C2 is equal to color new, blah, blah, blah. No, this much, this much, this much. So it has some color application RGB thing or something. Okay, so let's, let's, let's see how it explains it. This example warrants some explanation. Yep, it does. So first, a macro is channel is defined with the help uh, with the guard test. All right, is channel is a macro. It is used through this uh, keyword define. This is only here for convenience and to reduce syntax cluttering. For more information about macros, see the preprocessor. Okay, we'll see that later. So, uh, so this is a macro and. Uh, and these are the guard checks. It has to be a float and it also has to be in this range between 0 and 1. Okay. 0 and 1 included. Okay. So this function new by 4 creates a new map, new map term, and lets the keys red, green, blue, and alpha be associated with an initial value. Okay. Uh, channel which means this so this is it is double checking the for for the ranges and then what it is doing is it is creating a map where red corresponds to R green corresponds to G blue corresponds to B and alpha corresponds to A all right in this case only float values between and including 0 and 1 are allowed yep this is the guard check which is enforcing this and it's showed by his channel one macro for each argument only the this operator is allowed with creating a new map okay by calling blend slash two on any color term created by new slash four the resulting color can be calculated as determined by the two map terms okay the first thing blend slash two does is to create is to calculate the resulting alpha channel all right, alpha, it accepts two, uh, it accepts two macros. Uh, what does this sign mean? I don't know. Uh, 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 and then what is it doing? It is taking the SA value and adding uh, by doing some arithmetic with it and that is what it directly is returning the value associated with the key alpha is fetched for both arguments all right using this operator ah okay so this is the operator for getting the value from a map okay so from so the value from the map corresponding to uh Uh, corresponding to the corresponding to the key value key alpha is extracted by this operator and populated inside this variable it seems okay the other keys in the map are ignored the only alpha keys only the key alpha is required and checked for this is also the case for functions red blue and green it is doing similar stuff Okay. Uh, okay. So this is getting the value red, putting it in SV, put, getting alpha, putting it in SA. The difference is here that a check is made for two keys, right? The other keys are ignored. In the first, in this, one key was checked in alpha, and in red, two keys are checked. Finally, let us return the resulting color in blend three. All right. 
So Bentry, da da da. Okay. Destination DST is what is it? So red is taken out by calling uh, destination map is updated with a new channel values. The syntax for updating an existing key with a new value is with this operator. Okay. So this is not very clear. We'll probably see this from the uh, reference manual as well, but uh, I get some idea of it, but not absolutely crisp clear. So let's move on. This is an overview nevertheless, so we'll, we'll see things uh, where we need details. We'll uh, dive, dive into the reference manual and play around. All right, so Erlang has many modules to help you do things. For example, the module IO contains many functions that help in doing formatted IO to look up information about standard modules, a command Erl man can be used at the operating shell or command prompt. All right. The Erl dash man, try the operating system shell command Erl dash man IO and it gives all the details. Okay. If this does not work on your system, the documentation is the documentation is included as HTML, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Writing output to a terminal. It is nice to be able to do formatted outputs in examples. So the next example shows a simple way to use IO format function. Like all exported functions, you can test IO format function in the shell. All right, IO format, hello world, blah, blah. And there's an empty list. Uh, hello world, okay. IO format, this output, this outputs one a length term. So the blue N, hello, this output, and da, 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 okay. Populates, is it prints this list also prints the string and the list. This output contains two terms, so list of two terms, okay. Two terms, hello, so this is a list. Uh, hello world, it adds a space, so the space is probably, uh, this, this is, the formatting string is, uh, is, is, this space over here is manifesting as the space between hello and world, I guess. All right. The function format with two arguments take two lists. All right. The first one is nearly always a list written between two quotation marks. This list is printed out as it is, except that each tilde w is replaced by a term taken in order from the second list. Each tilde n is replaced by a new line. Oh, okay. So tilde w is taken from the uh, list. So hello, it would take hello for over here. If this first tilde D would take hello from this list and the second part of the list would be taken in the next test. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. Each tilde N is replaced by new line. The IO format two function itself returns the atom okay as it did over here and all times. If everything goes as planned, like other functions in Erlang, it crashes if an error occurs. This is not a fault in Erlang, it is a deliberate policy. Okay, Erlang has a sophisticated mechanism to handle errors, which are shown later. As an exercise, try to make IO format crash. It should not be difficult. But notice that although IO format crashes, the Erlang shell itself does not crash. So yeah, it would be easy. For example, if I write two, um, two tilde w's here, uh, there are not two elements in this list, so this would crash, right? All right, so next, next let's move on to the to a larger example. Now for a larger example to consolidate what you have learned so far, assume that you have a list of temperature readings from a number of cities in the world. Some of them are in Celsius and some in Fahrenheit. First, let us convert them all to Celsius and let's print the data neatly, all right? So this module the name is twit5. It is, exports a function format temps, which takes one argument, all right? Okay, so format temps uh, for an empty list, it returns okay, okay. Format temps for a list which has the first uh, element is assumed to be the city and the rest is the rest of the list. Print temperature, you, you convert to Celsius uh, city and format temperatures. Let's okay, convert to Celsius. Uh, uh, convert to Celsius, it expects what is this? Is it a map? The curry braces? Yeah, I guess. So it expects a single map which has a name and 
C temp, so it just returns as it as it is. So if there is a name and uh, no, it's not a map, it's a tuple. The curly braces were a tuple. Okay, okay. So basically convert to Celsius if it is given a temperature in Celsius already, it returns it because it's already in Celsius. So if it is given in Fahrenheit, then it returns the tuple with the same name. However, it returns instead of Fahrenheit, it returns in centigrade, indicated by the first element of the tuple over here and the rest it does the arithmetic manipulation. All right. So then we do the print temp function, which gets a, a tuple and it just clear prints it nicely, right? So over here it does, it gets first element from the list, which is the name. Uh, it does some formatting, I guess. Okay. So format temperatures from this list, which has uh, five parameters. Okay. So it shows Moscow minus 10 degrees C. Okay. Because it was already minus 10. Cape Town, this, this six degrees C. It was in Fahrenheit, it converted. Stockholm, this, this, this. And I finally it returns with okay. All right. Before Looking at how this program works, notice that a few comments are added to the code. A comment starts with a person character and goes on to the end of line. Notice also that the export format temp lines only includes a function format temps. The other functions are local functions since they are not exported and not uh, visible from outside. Yeah. Notice also that when testing the program from the shell, the input is threaded over two lines as the line was too long. Yeah, that's fine. When format temps is first called, it's called the first time city gets the value. This, yeah, I think we understand what it is doing. Um, anyways, let's see. Here is a function call as convert to Celsius as the argument to the function, blah, blah. When functions calls are nested like this, they execute or evaluate from inside out. Okay, this is important. The innermost will execute first. It will give its result outside and the cascading of the chain or nesting will keep happening like this. Okay, that is first convert to Celsius, blah, is evaluated and then it's given to this. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. 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 So print temp simply calls our format. Notice that this says to print the term with a field length of 15 and left justified. Yeah. Okay. So, so all right. Now format temps is called with the rest of the line as an argument. This way of doing things similar to the loop constructs in other languages. Yes, this is recursion, but do not let that worry you. Yeah. So the name function format temps function is called again. This time city gets the value. This, 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 blah, blah, blah. This is an until this becomes empty. So if we see the format temps, let's say again, this is the format temps. So yeah, it is recursive, right? Because it has two clauses. Um, so you print the temperature and then you format temps and print temperature is this. So yeah, it will get call, get called recursively, right? because the rest itself uh, is a list, right? So it is calling itself and that in turn, the first element of that list will be taken as city, so on and so forth, yeah. So this is very typical in, in functional languages, right? They're, they're heavily focused on a uh, recursive uh, way, right? Okay, so matching guards and scope of variables. It can be useful to find the maximum and minimum temperature in lists like this before extending the program to do this. Let us look at the functions. All right, so this is a module, list max function. So it gets a list and it gets, uh, it calls itself. And how does it call itself? Okay, this is interesting. It calls itself by taking, by calling another clause of its own and it gives the other clause the rest of the list first and the head after that interesting so list max is given an empty list and the rest of it and it returns rest of it because rest is clearly larger than uh, the empty list so see this is the beauty of recursion all right and the list max clause where the first tuple uh just a moment uh this is the no it's not a tuple sorry where you get a first list and the results so far okay the first list is seen 
uh, as again head or rest combination and the second is just a name okay when head is greater than result so far uh, 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 so this is some kind of an exit clause or something an error checking or something so if this happens then again this has to be enforced that the head is greater than it so what does it really do it calls itself with the rest first and the head later right uh, okay so list max again it gets a parameter head or rest and result so far all right in this case when head is not greater than result so far right because in that case this clause would match if it is not then this would match and over here it calls its own clause with rest as a first parameter but instead of head it gives results so far as the next parameter so this is a recursive definition of this function okay so you compile to it six and you try to give it um, this function give the max and it indeed returns a max all right first notice that the two functions have the same name yeah however each of these takes a di uh, different number of arguments so clauses the inner length these are regarded as completely different functions okay very interesting so they are not overloaded they are regarded as completely different functions where you need to distinguish between these functions you write name slash arity where arity is the number of arguments yeah okay very interesting this is really different from from typical languages and in this example you walk through a list carrying a value in this case result so far list max h1 simply assumes that the max value of the list is the head of the list and calls uh, list 2 with the rest of the list and the value of the head of the list in the above this would be this if you try to use list max one with an empty list or try to use it with something that's not a list at all, you would cause an error. Notice that the Erlang philosophy is not to handle errors of this type in the functions they occur, but to do so elsewhere. More about this later, right? So the runtime would be doing something. In list max two, you walk down the list and use head instead of results so far. Okay. When is a special word, all right? Used before this in the function to say that you only use this part of the function if the test that follows is true right a test of this type is called guard okay if the guard is false that is the guard fails then the next part of the function is tried okay uh in this case if head is not greater than result so far then it must be smaller or equal to it this means that the guard on the next part of the function is not needed yeah some useful operations in guards, they're all the logical operations and the uh, integer less than or greater than operation. Okay. Okay. So another way of creating and giving a variable a value is by using the match operator. So the, uh, the equal to operator is called a match operator as opposed to uh, many other languages where it is the assignment operator. So if you write m is equal to five, a variable called m is created, created with the value five. If in the same scope, you write m is equal to six and error is returned, okay? Okay. Okay, the use of match operator is particularly useful for pulling apart Erlang terms and creating new ones. Let's see how. So we create a tuple xy and populate it with another tuple. Okay, so we write what is x, x is Paris, what is y? Y is this double, which was the second part. Uh, 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 so how, ah, uh, okay. So I, I don't know why, why is it called the match operator? Because it is actually doing an assignment. Let's see. Here x gets the value pair, blah, blah. If you try to do the same again with another city, an error is returned. Yeah, because we, you cannot update it apparently. All right, variables can also be used to improve the readability of the programs. For example, in function list max, Two above with the arity two, you can write list max. This is also for when has blah blah new result far is equal to head rest new result for ah yeah okay good programming uh, uh, for clarity right 
all right we'll end this here and continue this in the second lecture second uh, uh, video all right bye